Water, water everywhere, and while there is a lot of it to drink, not so much of it is for free. Sales of bottled water have gone up a hundred times. In about 20 years, companies making billions and only paying just a few dollars for the privilege. Are they sucking this valuable resource dry? This is Roundtable. I'm David Foster. It is a human right, many would argue, to have access to water. So why do we allow some multinationals, apparently, to take advantage, slug down massive profits? Who, if anyone, is looking after our interests? The bottled water market is spilling over. Sales are 100 times greater than they were two decades ago. But where does all that plastic and aluminium wrapped liquid come from? Are soft drink giants sucking the well dry? It was a Perrier advert in the 1970s that sparked a new craze. Perrier, its natural sparkle is more delicate than any made by man. Since then, new products have flooded the global market. One that was valued at $157 billion in 2013 and is expected to reach $280 billion by 2020. Government failure to deliver clean drinking water has also turned people away from the tap. 77 million Americans are served by water systems that violate testing requirements. And in Flint, Michigan, dangerous levels of lead were found in the water being piped straight into people's homes, meaning families were grateful for bottled supplies. Compared with the water used in agriculture and energy production, the bottled water business is a drop in the ocean. But sometimes bottled water comes from drought-ridden region. Maine and Texas have an absolute capture rule that says landowners can take all the groundwater they want, while Michigan, New York and other states have stricter reasonable use laws. Nestle is the world's largest bottled water company. It sold $7.7 .7 billion worth of bottled water in 2016. The company drew about 30 million gallons of water from the San Bernardino forest in 2016, in the midst of California's drought. The company claims it has rights dating back more than a century, but the drink giant has a bad reputation for sucking up the water supply. Nestle has a reputation worldwide of going to poor, poor rural communities offering all kinds of economic benefits to the community that never really materialize, uh, and taking as much water as they can get, and when a stream runs dry, they leave. Nestle's former chief executive officer, Peter Brabeck, drew criticism in 2005 for saying, one perspective held by various NGOs, which I would call extreme, is that water should be declared a human right. The other view is that water is a grocery product, and just as every other product, it should have a market value. Introducing levies on bottled water has been floated as a solution to the problem, but such proposals have so far been unsuccessful, allowing companies to continue to take advantage of weak legislation around water. The UN says 1.8 billion people will live with dire water shortages by 2025. With climate change and population increase pushing water supplies to the limit, is it time companies paid properly for their share of this liquid asset? And I'm pleased to say at the round table today we have Philippe Coulet, who specialises in international and environmental law at SOAS University. Asad Raymond's here, executive director of War on Want, a charity fighting the root causes of poverty. We have the branding consultant, Jonathan Wilson. And Richard Wellings from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Big welcome to, to each one of you. Um, Asad, I think I'll start this off uh, with you. Are, are we being conned or are we just being let down by the people who should provide us with safe drinking water? Well, as your clip showed, I mean, water is a fundamental right. It's uh, the right to breathe clean air or, or have clean water should be a right that should be afforded to absolutely everybody. It shouldn't be determined by your ability to be able to pay. And the reality is, of course, that that's not 
the case and in fact the situation has actually got much much worse uh, for many many people uh, the figures that you you spoke about there I mean we still face with 2,000 children die each day from waterborne diseases and, and lack of access to clean water now how do we tackle that well I think there are two choices there is a choice which says this is a fundamental right and it's an issue of the common and it should be a owned by people and and therefore the state should provide that and it should provide it effectively and there's lots of models or you simply say well private companies should be allowed to provide that and then of course you do okay well but the, the question at the beginning was are we being conned i think we are being conned i think we're being conned in a huge way i mean the, the i mean the biggest con of course is is the fact that millions of people in britain today will be drinking bottled water which is no better uh, and in fact in many cases the water from our tap systems is cleaner uh, uh, than the b bottled water so of course that's advertising and we know the power of advertising is to make us to buy things that we don't want to do that we don't need okay representing the the brands a big con what comes out of the tap is just as good if not better I think that's debatable and I think it's difficult for for consumers because there are so many mixed messages because just as you've you've made these very you know reasonable points um, you know if you do an internet search you, you'd find out that in London people are concerned about the estrogen levels in in water uh, so much so that there have been surveys where was it 50 percent of, of low uh, river fish uh, turned from male to female um, and then you know th there are there are debates about whether we should because have the water supply is being pumped into the rivers yeah because of uh, yeah because of the uh, contraceptive pill and, mm. and and that being recycled within within the water or, or then for example um, you know you've got debates on, on fluoridization of water so if consumers are faced with those kind of headlines which which are worrying right then then the thing that they want to reach for is the bottle of water in which their ingredients are there and they feel as if you know so I think yeah they're, yeah, they're yeah, 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 yeah but, but, but but the brands don't discourage this do they they know they're quite happy to see these headlines these arguments because it means people go out and buy their product that's a bit of a con isn't yeah it? brands are happy but then we also have to look at the fact that there's been an increase in bottled water consumption because there's been a decrease in soft drink consumption and sugary drinks okay. so that is a good thing because they sure. Tea, it's coffee, kombucha, it, it, uh, all of these things uh, have gone Absolutely. Up. But we could solve that by having free water fountains. In, in Which the, they're going to get a lot more of in, in uh, London. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, the, the, I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that the reason why people are moving to bottled water is because of concerns about the safety of water uh, in, in general which of course is partly responsible as a result of deregulation the very thing that you promote which you say companies will do this better well we've have a privatized uh, water system in this country it hands out billions in dividends to its shareholders uh, it doesn't invest in 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 infrastructure and so you know, you're causing the problem. Sorry, and then you're sorry there's been no deregulation. There's been a huge raft of EU regulation on the water industry uh, over the last 20 years. So that's just nonsense. It's a very, very tightly regulated industry. Well, I, I, I'm going to bring Philippe in at this particular point. Say what you want to say, and then I've got a question for okay, you. As an environmentalist. Maybe the, <laughs> maybe the first point will be in terms of con consumers, as, as soon as we call human rights holders, there is a fine maybe it's <laughs> this side and that side of the table but there is a human right to water if there is no human right to water there is no human rights system fine even though it hasn't been recognized formally for so many years if there is a human right to water we all right holders we are not consumers so that's a big basic problem when we start calling people water users consumers it kind of started from this country because that's where we had the full privatization in the first place it's now extended to most of the global south where even in countries where the formal recognition of the right which is not the case in this country so here in this country we have a problem because the right is not actually recognized but in all these countries where the right is now formally recognized either through uh, judicial decisions or the constitution as in the case of south africa um, people are still called consumers that's a big problem and then that tells us that water is not that shared free public good that we all sought for centuries if not millennia it was Richard, I, I sort of cut you off a little bit. I'm terribly sorry about that. So finish what you were saying. No, well, I actually think there's a, a really positive story here that the industry is providing um, clean drinking water to vast numbers of people in developing countries. And also when you get brand names, I mean, uh, Nestle, Coca-Cola get a lot of criticism, but they're actually brands that people trust and they know if they buy those brands, that's going to be clean, safe water to drink. What so about the time when Coca-Cola, I think it was, um, 
started marketing its own bottled water and we found out it had just come straight from the tap. I mean, that's right, and that's reprehensible in terms of marketing, but I think we should be looking at the developing world here where water generally isn't safe to drink, and okay. if you get this low-cost provision from the private sector, that's a really positive story. Do you think there are two separate arguments here? One is whether we're being conned by the marketing companies and therefore you have to have money to buy it, and the other is whether there is water available and made available in developing countries. Well, I think in, in a way there's a symbiosis and it's actually uh, the market's driving things in the right direction. I mean, where there is a problem is where governments collude with some of these big awards companies in developing countries and give them special access to water and deny it to other people and stop competition where you get these artificial monopolies. That is a real problem. So as long as you can avoid the crony capitalist aspects, then it's a win-win situation. I mean, it's, it's ironic that you mentioned Nestle as, a, as one of the brands where, which we should trust. I mean, especially after the infamous, uh, its role in, in the baby milk scandal, which is exactly what it did there, which was encourage people and mothers to use baby milk poison when actually breast milk was much more important. So what it did was say, we're going to put our bottom dollar, our profit ahead of the rights of people. And that's simply what it's doing around water as well. So I think there is absolutely a water crisis and that water crisis we know is going to get much, much worse with climate change, with all of these issues. If, if, we, are, sorry, if we are being ripped off, going back to the original point, why are we allowing it to happen? Well, I think we live in a world where I think all of us and every, youth, every single one of us would recognise that increasingly big business is much more powerful than our governments and ordinary people. And so our voices are not being heard. That's why we live in a world which is deeply unequal, where the richest eight people earn more wealth than the overwhelming majority of the world's population. Corporations are racking up trillions in profits, and yet more of and more of us become as more and more poor. Come on, so, that's, so I think not, that's not true. Well, There's well, been it a is. huge reduction in poverty in countries like China and India due to economic growth. It's complete nonsense. So, Living standards have improved enormously in much of the developing world. So, we should be optimistic. Are, are we getting off the subject just a little bit? Because we're well, talking well, about one particular resource. Well, but I think it's it's a it's a systemic issue. So fun, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned both China and India, and it's always China and India are always always mentioned as the examples to show that poverty uh, rates have, 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 have improved. Well, actually, that's where state intervention, state policy did it. Private sector did not do it. Both of the examples, both India and China, that's what's happened. It's a mixture, so, it's a mixture of both. Well, come, well, on, come on, look at all these entrepreneurs I want to bring China. Jonathan back in, back in on this one, because he said, sat very quietly since we accused him of being a representative of <laughs> a, bunch, a bunch of con artists, which we're not yeah. say, saying they are. But, yeah. I mean, it, it, it is... Who recognised at one point that water could be sold like this. Where did that come from? Well, if we look at brands or the theory of branding, I mean, I would say that brands are as old as human beings are. Like, we've always wanted to label things to make them easy to recognise and understand. So whether that's, you know, a government or a political party or hieroglyphs or, like, you know, flags, any of these things, they, they conform to brand theory. So. I, can, I want to disagree slightly with this idea that, that brands are bad. Brands are a reflection of, of humans and culture, right? And also, you know, I mean, I'm a professor of branding. I, I lecture about 100 different nationalities every year at university. And if I was to take you to, to my classrooms and was to put you in front of these students from different backgrounds all across the world, say, so, so you're training to become blood-sucking... Um, insects are you are you, you want to basically you know do people over you want to kind of join these companies and make lots of money and screw over your, your neighbors I think that's ridiculous there are lots of people that go to business school that want to make a change want to make a difference so I see them when they start their education they leave they join companies and so this idea of the corporation being one distinct identity that is evil or is against lots of other people doesn't reflect on, on the ground level so like Nestle for example I was we're talking to people in, in, in Malaysia, when you see on the ground level people working for a, a global company in their region doing good things, whether that's um, baby milk formula or water or halal or anything like that, then, then you can see that these companies would, would, are making a difference. Would it be a little trite to suggest that these corporations are also quite happy to see dolphins, whales and turtles die because the water's put into plastic bottles which are just dumped everywhere and it's only suddenly now that the world has a conscience that the companies are doing something about it. I think that's a fallacious argument because I mean the idea that, that you do this you, you produce bottled water and then say that you're happy for dolphins to die to me that's that's 
that doesn't make sense. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. And even if we look at why people are using uh, consuming bottled water or you know, water being a basic human right, the reality is, I mean, if I take a, a tangent, let's look at the pharmaceutical industry, right? Paracetamol is a generic brand, right? Then you've got Tylenol and you've got Panadol. Now, they're a lot more expensive, but if you ask people which one they would rather have, even presented with the evidence, they still go for this branded entity. And even there are studies that would show that kind of that Panadol, Paracetamol, whatever, doesn't treat lower back pain in the way that people <coughs> think that it does. So, so we're dealing with complicated human yeah. emotions that it's easy to pin the blame on the brand when so actually, jump in. you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, com coming back to where did it come from? I guess it came from a specific policy push particularly from the early 1990s, where we said we want to understand water as a commodity, as an economic good, some things that had not happened before. So it didn't just happen. It's also not just about big companies or small companies. It's something broader that's floating around. I guess the latest example for me is the so-called water ATMs, where... Oh, you, you mentioned this in the notes I got. I'd like you to explain them. Well, what are ATMs? Are essentially ATMs, like everybody knows uh, in this part of the world. Uh, you bring a card, you put your card in, uh, but instead of getting money, you get one liter, or usually, at least that's the case in India, one liter or 20 liters. It's in terms of bottles. It's not a bottle because it's not a bottle standard, so they don't have to follow the bottled... Um, you have to bring your bottle. own just to get you it filled You have to bring up. your yeah, own, yeah. but it's understood as bottle, so it fits well, very well within the discussion we're having. Uh, it's one litre or 20 litres, which is the idea that it's your domestic consumption, it's not just your uh, need of the next two minutes. But it's a complete reduction, of, apart from the problem that it participates of an understanding of the commoditization of water, where we understand mm. water as nothing different from money. And that really is a huge problem when we all agree, supposedly, that water is a human right. <laughs> And, sorry, and it's yeah. also a reduction in terms of the amount of water because we say there is a human right to water which has to cover not just those three to five litres that we drink, but also cooking, hygiene, sanitation, which is definitely more than 20 litres, for instance, that you would get from that water ATM. But we are getting to a point where we're saying, OK, if we've given you or if you've paid, because obviously water ATM implies that you have to pay uh, those 20 litres, then you're kind of covered. And that's another big problem. Is there any example of the, the big companies um, doing something to help the other side of the equation, not just provide bottled water which consumers may like, but also to take the provision of safe and free or limited cost water to the poorer people? Any, no? Well, it is what Should they? Well, I mean, they, they? that's what they're doing with things like this ATM. Let's look on the positive side. Let's but but are the big bit. companies involved in this? Well, I don't know about that specific example. But what I'm saying is that this uh, putting in proper water infrastructure mm. like we have in, in the West is hugely expensive, plus all the treatment plants, et cetera, et cetera. So if private business is actually going in there ahead of the game and providing... Uh, safe water to drink. That's actually a positive thing. And eventually, obviously, as these countries develop, then the infrastructure will catch up. But in the meantime, that's going to take decades to happen. So the most important thing is that the, the um, poor people get access to what, clean drinking water by whatever well, let, let's means put, possible. Let's put this to Jonathan. Would it be something you would advise a big corporation to do? Um, to make it look like they were involved in community work rather than just simply in providing a commodity at a particular price. Completely, yeah. If you want to have, especially so now... So what would you say to, to... Well, we've mentioned Nestle, we've mentioned Coca-Cola. I mean, there are so yeah. many of them. What would you say to them? I would say that businesses need to take a long, hard look at what's around them and they need to be in line with what's going on in the environment. I mean, it's not just water. I mean, if we look at this year, it's been phenomenal. If we look at uh, companies like Nike being called out because of, um, because of their unequal treat treatment of women in the United States of America, Starbucks having to close stores for diversity training, you know, everyone's being called out and, and things are being tightened up, which is a good thing. So my advice would be take a long-term perspective and mm. if you want to have a business next year then you really need to think about a how any you suggestion do... that this is happening that they're thinking of this themselves that you're aware yeah, of yeah i i believe so i because of the the next generation of people that have come through that are looking at all of these policies that are encouraging people i mean uh, at the university i used to work at um, they got rid of kind of plastic cups Right, they got rid of bins, like you know, <laughs> at the expense of uh, annoying people. Like companies are looking at, at uh, the consumption of water, even right down to the taps. You know, you get those connectors. Um, that, that uh, and yet, sorry, I've got to ask you this question. You, you mentioned an example of Brazil and Bolivia where people are fighting the big water companies. That's not what we're hearing 
uh, Jonathan's advice uh, to be? Uh, well, what fact, is happening there? It, in fact, it's, it's happening all around the world, right? I mean, increasingly, people talk about there are water wars going on, uh, where people are demanding the right to water. Just a few weeks ago, but isn't that thousands of people, thousands of people occupied the Nestle offices and companies in Brazil, right? Exactly because Brazil, the Nestle was expropriating and exploiting the water resources of indigenous communities for profit and denying local and communities the right to water. You see the same pattern all over in many, many parts of the world. So it does come back to a fundamental issue. Should water be a human right? But the UN says it's a human right. So what does that mean? Is it only accessible <clears throat> or affordable? What, does, what do companies... But it also, it also comes back to the very first question I asked you. Not only did I say, was it a con, but I also said, was it a government's duty to provide this? Absolutely. Is the government therefore failing? It's not just big business, is it? No, I was about to come to that, because yeah. the water ATM story is one more of these stories where there may be corporate social responsibility initiatives happening, and that, at least in India, that's what's happening, so we have it uh, happening. But that's a huge problem, because if there is a human right, there is a duty holder who is the government. If the government's policy to do drinking water, uh, to bring drinking water to everyone, when we go through this kind of individual initiatives, we'll never cover everyone, because it's per groups of people. It'll be people who can afford to pay, because we're talking only about paid for water. And there is no sense of having to bring the water preferentially to people who are most marginalized or who are most in need. Yeah, but come off. So we, need this, we need public policy. So public yeah, policy yeah, yeah. is at the core. It's plowed cuckoo land that these very poor countries are going to have the money, resources, to put in this hugely expensive water but infrastructure. But I think at this point we've, we so just... perhaps they should charge the water companies more for doing what they're doing and reinvest the money? Well, that would be counterproductive because they would just slow the roll out of the private provision. So that's the danger there. It could be counter. Well, if, if a big company had to give the government some money to make the government's services better, that, that would... Well, exactly. It would deter, In what way would it, deter it be them from invest, It would deter the private companies from investing. We've got to see this as a positive story of the markets extending and providing clean water where it At the expense of? Well, where, where there is a problem is where you get collusion between these big companies and governments who then steal water resources, as you said, from indigenous people. That is a problem. That's not a free market. It's crony capitalism. It does need to be stamped out. That's what I, I agree with you completely on that. Environmentally, we're seeing cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, Mexico City sinking because the water resources underneath those cities is being taken out at such an incredible... And, you know, I'm asking you as an environmentalist. Um, how big a danger is that? Okay, but then I'll take it linking to that. Yeah, yeah. Private, private sector investment is only within very limited uh, patterns. For instance, it won't be about bringing the water from 200 or 500 kilometers away that all these large cities today need because they've exhausted their own water supply. B the building of dams, canals, pipes that will bring the bulk water to the cities, that's not something that the private sector will ever do. Except they, because did, that in, they did that in the, in the 18th century, didn't they, in the West? But that's They built reservoirs all over the place, so what you're saying is complete nonsense. But I think we also know that this, it is in these cities that f the f first part of the world where it was nationalised, or whatever. So then we come we, back to government and corporate. Yes, yeah, so, uh, because the poor were not being served in this city. So I think that's exactly but where it's There's a big environmental from. danger here, isn't there? No, that as well, obviously. Yeah. But uh, the investment has never been in the pipes for everyone. It's for certain people. It, it starts with the Latin American examples in Cochabamba, where one of the points of crisis of the privatization was the extension of the network to unserved people, so-called unserved people. We keep getting that around the world, and it's clear that one of the things the human right to water discourse brings is that it, foster, it puts an additional mm -hmm. obligation on governments to invest in those pipe ne networks, which can then be privatized. But the pipe networks themselves will not be paid for by a private I'll, I'll come to you in just a second. I have no idea whether this came from a tap or whether it came um, out, out of a, a bottle, whether it's mineral, whether it's spring, whether it's been chlorinated. It doesn't taste, it doesn't, doesn't smell bad. But that, that's the point, isn't it? It varies wherever you happen to be. You don't know whether you're going to get good stuff. I mean, stuff that comes out of my tap at home smells awful, and you wouldn't want to drink it. This smells OK. How do we standardise that sort of thing so that everybody thinks that what they're getting is OK? Well, you want the state to regulate. That means we're having regulations. That means the, you, the state having the ability to be able to say, these are resources that every person should have a right to. Jonathan, very quickly, have the 
water bottling companies gone as far as they can, or are we going to see an even... A hundred times has gone up in 20 years. Are we going to see even bigger? I think we're going to see more. But I'd, I'd, I'd also like to pull back to what Assad is saying. And, and the clock is ticking. OK. Branding, marketing doesn't just apply to multinational corporations. It applies to what governments do and policy. So if we're talking about clean water and what it is that goes into your cup, we need to know. And that means that governments, if they are owning uh, reservoirs of water, need to tell consumers and they can influence consumption as well. I think it's a big mistake just to say that branding and marketing happens with, with private companies. Quick show of hands. Uh, bottled water, con or not? Con. Yes? Um, con? OK, so 2-2. Two, two. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask, as we wrap up the programme, off camera, um, is this bottled or is this out of the tap? Can I get an answer? The silence was deafening. I don't know, it still tastes OK. <laughs> I'm hoping out of the tap. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much indeed for coming yeah. on the programme. Look, you know, it is, whatever we think of it, an absolute human right. And uh, the argument is that uh, perhaps some companies are taking advantage of the fact that we cannot do without it and it's becoming a very scarce resource in certain parts of the world. Thank you for coming on the programme. Thank you for watching. I'm David Foster. This has been Roundtable. Hope to have your company next time. Goodbye. <laughs>